You've found the Magnificent People Horror Stories Podcast. Merry Christmas. Welcome. I'm Robert Crandall, and you are a magnificent person for listening to this podcast, and I am grateful. Please tell a friend. Maybe they would like to be a magnificent person, too. This is uh, the final episode for for this year, and then I will be uh, traveling and stuff. And uh, so back in uh, Jan- we'll be back in January doing it all over again. And I have some has some things planned for next year. Uh, things may get a little bit on the more gruesome side. <laughs> I don't know. I've just got some ideas, and and I I don't know which ones I'm going to to do and which ones I'm not and so forth. But uh, stick around. Uh, I'm looking forward to next year. Got some stories I want to do that are pretty good. So uh, anyway, that's where that's where we're at. And that's why I changed the name to Horror Stories Podcast because the other name just said short stories and didn't really indicate horror. And so I want that name to be horror because I want to... S- Try and get uh, more horror centric, let's say, for next year. We'll see how it goes. And uh, we do have a new logo for uh, the new name. Kudos goes out to Willow Brook of WillowbrookFineArt.com. And Brook has an E on it, by the way. Uh, kudos to her for designing the new logo. Yay! Yay! Uh, see, low budget here. I can't afford any sound effects that uh, would have been appropriate there. But anyway, uh, in that site, again, is uh, willowbrookfineart.com. Oh, I have an announcement uh, to make here. You see, this is a septic safe podcast. <laughs> I, uh, I saw that. Uh, on this, uh, <laughs> you know, I bought some uh, bath tissue, you call it, and it said <laughs> septic safe on it. Well, this is a septic safe podcast, and by that I mean <clears throat> there is no, there are no, there is no explicit language heard on on this podcast. So I just thought I'd throw that. I saw that on the side of <laughs> Anyhow, uh, sometimes I just get goofy. I hope you don't mind. Anyhow, uh, let's see what else we got we got going by oh Amanda sent in a picture of a horror Christmas tree. Yes, and it's on the website. And our website, of course horrorstoriespodcast.com or the old one works too. Adventuresinaudio.net, either one. And you'll see this picture of a Christmas tree that Amanda sent in. You just click the thumbnail to enlarge it. And it's really cool. You know, maybe we'll start. Do you have a horror photograph or something you would like to send in? Maybe we'll start a little gallery. You know, uh. We'll see. Yeah, send a send a JPEG though, if you would please, and uh, we'll put yours up there. We also have a picture of uh, Grace from Arkansas, the 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 monster that she depicted in her nightmare, which we played some time ago, and uh, her and a friend did this painting of this horrible creature, and it's on the website too. So send yours in if you have something. Send it to the uh, my horrible dream at gmail.com, uh, the same one you send the nightmares to. And uh, okay, now uh, for the news. Well, no, we're not going to do news on this podcast. We never do that. It's not that kind of show. But um, a study about podcasts says that if you listen to podcasting more than five hours a week, you are a super listener. Well, we have a couple of super listeners to this podcast. Gregory says he listened to each episode 
five times. Wow. Thank you, Gregory. And Amanda sent in a screenshot of her phone, and it showed that she had listened to this ep- or this podcast uh, the most of any others, and uh, that was 104 episodes for a total of 7,460 minutes, and listened to 26 episodes in one day. Now, that's binge. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gregory and Amanda, for your support of, of the show. I, I'm really blown away by that, I, and I thank you so much. And, you know, I, I want to thank them, and I, I want to thank you as well. If you listen to this podcast one time, to me, you are a super listener, too. I appreciate all who listen to this to this show. It really means a lot. It really does. And uh, I thank, thank you, thank you so, so very much. Our feature story is The Christmas Goblins by Charles Dickens, who died after suffering a stroke. Now, in the last two episodes, I played a PSA about high blood pressure and stroke. A good friend of mine died a few years ago after having a stroke. He had high blood pressure, and it killed him. And I had never, it was the first time I ever knew anybody who had a stroke, and it was dreadful. And I've never paid attention to high blood pressure because every time mine has been checked, it's been perfect counting my lucky stars, and I haven't had it checked for a while. I need to probably get in and get it checked again, and and maybe you should too. And I'm going to play the PSA again, and I'll play it from time to time, not every episode, but it, this is something, you know, we hear so much these days about this virus thing, which I haven't mentioned at all because you hear it everywhere else. And you never hear anything about high blood pressure or heart disease, diabetes, or anything like you used to because this virus has taken over all the headlines and so forth. So after I saw my my friend die, and when I went to see him in the hospital, he looked like a dead man. His face was like ash gray or something. It was It was really quite, quite disturbing and horrible. So I'm going to play this PSA and and urge you take care of your blood pressure. I don't want anything to happen to you. And when I saw it, you know, it just, like I said, I had never given stroke of thought or anything until I saw him. And it was because of his high blood pressure. So Charles Dickens, who wrote our feature story, died after having a stroke. So let's, I hope, uh, uh, I just want to pass that on and hope that, uh, that you're okay. And we will hear The Christmas Goblins by Charles Dickens. After this, 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. In an old abbey town, a long, long while ago, there officiated as sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard, one Gabriel Grubb. He was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow who consorted with nobody but himself in an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large, deep waistcoat pocket. 
A little before twilight, one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern, and betook himself toward the old churchyard, for he had a grave to finish by next morning. And feeling very low, he thought it might raise his spirits, perhaps, if he went on with his work at once. He strode along until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard, a nice, gloomy, mournful place, into which the townspeople did not care to go except in broad daylight. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a merry Christmas. Gabriel waited until the boy came up, then wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away with his hand on his head, Gabriel Grubb chuckled to himself and entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, put down his lantern, and getting into the unfinished grave, worked at it for an hour or so with great good will. But the earth was hardened with frost, and it was no easy matter to break it up and shovel it out. At any other time, this would have made Gabriel very miserable. But he was so pleased at having stopped the small boy's singing that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made when he had finished the work for the night, and looked down into the grave with grim satisfaction, murmuring as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one, a few feet of cold earth when life is done. Ho, ho, he laughed as he set himself down on a flat tombstone which was a favorite resting place of his, and drew forth his wicker bottle. A coffin at Christmas, a Christmas box. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, 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 repeated a voice close beside him. It was the echoes, said he, rising the bottle to his lips again. It was not, said a deep voice. Gabriel started up and stood rooted to the spot with terror, for his eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone close to him was a strange, unearthly figure. He was sitting perfectly still, grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin could call up. "'What do you do here on Christmas Eve?' said the goblin sternly. I came to dig a grave, sir, stammered Gabriel. What man wanders among graves on such a night as this? cried the goblin. Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb, screamed a wild chorus of voices that seemed to fill the churchyard. What have you got in that bottle? said the goblin. Hollins, sir, replied the sexton, trembling more than ever for he bought it of the smugglers, and he thought the questioner might be in the excise department of the goblins. Who drank Solon's alone and in a churchyard on such a night as this? Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb, exclaimed the wild voices again. And who then is our lawful prize? exclaimed the goblin, raising his voice. The invisible chorus replied, Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? Said the goblin, as he grinned a broader grin than before. The sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? It is very, very curious, sir, very, very, very curious, sir, and very pretty, replied the sexton, half dead with fright. But I think I'll go back and finish my work, sir, if, if you please. Work, said the goblin. What work? The grave, sir. Oh, the grave, eh? Who makes a grave at a time when other men are merry and takes a pleasure in it? Again the voices replied, Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. 
I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin. Under favor, sir, replied the horror-stricken sexton. I don't think they can. They don't know me, sir. I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me. Oh, yes, they have. We know the man who struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart because the boy could be merry, and he could not. Here the goblin gave a loud, shrill laugh, which the echoes returned twentyfold. I, I am afraid I must leave, sir, said the sexton, making an effort to move. Leave us, said the goblin. Ho, ho, ho. As the goblin laughed, he suddenly darted toward Gabriel, laid his hand upon his collar, and sank with him through the earth. And when he had had time to fetch his breath, he found himself in what appeared to be a large cavern, surrounded on all sides by goblins, ugly and grim. And now, said the king of the goblins, seated in the center of the room on an elevated seat, his friend of the churchyard, Show the man of misery and gloom a few pictures from our great storehouses. As the goblin said this, a cloud rolled gradually away and disclosed a small and scantily furnished but neat apartment. Little children were gathered round a bright fire, clinging to their mother's gown or gamboling around her chair. A frugal meal was spread upon the table and an elbow chair was placed near the fire. Soon the father entered, and the children ran to meet him. As he sat down to his meal, the mother sat by his side, and all seemed happiness and comfort. What do you think of that? said the goblin. Gabriel murmured something about its being very pretty. Show him some more, said the goblin. Many a time the cloud went and came and many a lesson it taught to Gabriel Grubb. He saw that men who worked hard and earned their scanty bread were cheerful and happy, and he came to the conclusion it was a very respectable sort of world after all. No sooner had he formed it than the cloud closed over the last picture, seemed to settle on his senses, and lull him to repose. One by one the goblins faded from his sight, and as the last one disappeared, he sank to sleep. The day had broken when he awoke, and found himself lying on that flat gravestone, with the wicker bottle empty by his side. He got on his feet as well as he could, and brushing the frost off his coat, turned his face toward town. But he was an altered man, he had learned lessons of gentleness and good nature by his strange adventures in the Goblin's Cavern. You've been listening to The Christmas Goblins by Charles Dickens, who once said, I will honor Christmas in all my heart and try to keep it all the year. I've enjoyed being with you and I hope to be with you again soon. Please be well, and thank you for listening to me.